Hello everyone, I hope everyone is doing good and all is well. Today's chat is going to be about the very sad and famous Rosewood Massacre of 1923. Now I refer to the massacre as famous because many people didn't know about the massacre until the release of John Singleton's famous film in 1997 titled Rosewood, starring Veen Rames. Now, during the first week of January 1923, the predominantly black town of Rosewood, located in central Florida, was destroyed and many lives were lost. Now, we're going to discuss the actual number of lives lost a little bit later. Now, many of you may remember the movie's tale of what happened, but what you learn here today may be a bit more intriguing. Hopefully, you all learn a little something new each time you stop by, which is greatly appreciated. So, with that being said, let's chat. Rosewood, Florida was the home of a prospering and unincorporated community of predominantly African American people. Located in Levy County, approximately one mile northeast of Sumner and about nine miles northeast of Cedar Key, Rosewood was originally settled in 1845 by a mixed group of black and white people, and this remained the same until around the 1890s. Now, majority of the employment in Rosewood was provided by pencil factories until around the 1890s as well. Now, around about the 1890s, the factories began to close due to the destruction of the cedar tree population. And this left many of the Rosewood citizens without jobs. Now, of course, we know when a large number of people within a town lose their job and their means of supporting themselves and their families, there can be a lot of anger and tension, which definitely was the case when it comes to Rosewood. Not only did the citizens have to deal with losing their jobs, there was also a lot of racial tension following the Civil War, and there was a lot of racial tension surrounding black codes and Jim Crow laws especially. Now, we can already figure out that all of this racial tension caused a great divide and segregation of the community of Rosewood. Now, before we move on, I would like to elaborate a little more on the Black Codes and the Jim Crow laws. Now, many reports refer to the Black Codes as the roots of the Jim Crow laws. Now, immediately following the ratification of the 13th Amendment, around about 1865, there were strict state and local laws called Black Codes. Now, black codes or laws, they existed throughout the South, and they pretty much limited the freedom of African Americans. Now, the black codes forced the black people to work like slaves for pennies on the dollar, if that. And the black codes, they also controlled where and how the formerly enslaved black people worked. They took away the black citizens' voting rights. They controlled where the black people lived. They controlled how the black people traveled and they were used to seize black children for labor. Now, the former slaves, they were supposed to be free and treated equally at this time. But this doesn't sound like that to me. Sounds more like a a form of modern day slavery, in my opinion. But hey, that's just my opinion. You know, you all can agree to disagree if you prefer in the comments, you know, respectfully, of course. But moving on along. Now, former Confederate soldiers, they were the ones mainly serving as judges and police throughout the South. So they ensured the black codes were enforced. Now, remember, the Confederates, they were the ones who supported slavery and did not want it to end. So surely they enforced the black codes. I mean, they also made it very difficult for African-Americans to win court cases. The African-Americans really didn't stand a chance, and the legal system was pretty much stacked against them. Now, the black prisoners, they were treated as enslaved people, and they often received much longer sentences than their white equals. 
Now, many of the black prisoners, they didn't even make it long enough to carry out their sentences. And this was due to the excruciating work that they were forced to complete. Now, does it sound like much has changed from then to now when it comes to the justice system today? I mean, I'm just going to say, you know, but let's keep on going. Now, as I said earlier, black codes were pretty much the roots of Jim Crow laws. Now, Jim Crow laws, they were named after a black minstrel show character. Now, for those who don't know what that is, a black minstrel show character is pretty much a white performer in blackface. Which we all know what that means, but let's keep on moving. Now, Jim Crow laws, they were a collection of local and state statutes that legalized racial segregation. And they were they were enforced until about 1965. These are whites only pies. Now, with the citizens of Rosewood dealing with the tension caused from losing their jobs, black holes, Jim Crow laws and segregation, the white families began to move away and settle in the nearby town of Sumner. Now, by the 1920s, the entire population of Rosewood, which consisted of about 200 citizens, was entirely made up of black people, with the exception of one white family that ran the general store. Now that we've went over a little backstory, you know, about Rosewood, let's get into what we are really here for. The Rosewood Massacre. Now, on January the 1st, 1923, in the town of Sumner, Florida, the screams of a 22-year-old white woman named Fanny Taylor were heard by her neighbor. Now, when Fanny's neighbor went to her aid... Fanny began yelling that she was assaulted by a black man. Fanny stated that a black man entered her home and assaulted her. Now, Fanny stated that she was not assaulted sexually when she reported her incident or the incident rather to Sheriff Robert Walker. Fanny, in fact, specifically stated that she was only assaulted. However... When it came to the white citizens of Sumner, Florida, assault was always looked at as a sexual violation, regardless if it were or not. So, of course, the citizens of Sumner, Florida, they were outraged and they were in an uproar when Fanny's claims of her assault spread throughout the town. Now, when the people of Rosewood got wind of Fanny's claims, The black citizens who worked in the town of Sumner, they immediately began saying that the assault was caused by Fanny's lover and that she made the story up because she was married and afraid of what her husband would do had he found out about her affair. So in other words, Fanny was cheating, sneaking and freaking, according to the reports. Now, Fanny, she was married to a foreman at the local mill named Mr. James Taylor. And when Mr. Taylor got news of his wife's assault and saw her bruises, and according to the reports, Franny did have bruises, James, he was outraged. James was so furious, he escalated the town's outrage by gathering an angry mob of white citizens to hunt down the alleged black suspect. And Fanny's claims couldn't have come at a worse time. Fanny made her claims within days of a Ku Klux Klan or KKK rally set to take place in nearby Gainesville, Florida. And to make matters even worse, Franny's husband, James, he actually asked the nearly 500 man clan for help, along with white residents in the neighboring counties. And they obliged. Now, the white mobs, they began prowling through the woods in search of any black man they could possibly find. And they did this until deputy until the deputy sheriff began stating he believed an escaped chain gang member, a black man by the name of Jesse Hunter, was the number one suspect. And although there were there was no evidence to support these claims, Jesse became public enemy number one. And the mob believed he was being hidden by one of the black residents of Rosewood. 
Now, once the massive white mob made it to Rosewood, the torture and horrendous acts they committed against the black citizens of Rosewood were so horrific, it's still hard to believe to this day. Now, I can't really get down to the full nitty gritty with the details because, of course, this is YouTube and there's only so much I can say with all the censorship. But I am going to give you all some pretty good in-depth details. Hopefully, you know, I don't get in trouble for it, but I'm going to give you all some pretty good details about what took place in Rosewood. So buckle your seatbelts. Now, if you're very sensitive or easily triggered, then your ride stops here. Please ex exit the video now. Please exit now if you're sensitive or easily triggered. Now, I may set up a Discord or something later, you know, probably later on down the line so I can give you all the, you know, all of the full details of my videos and really get down to the nitty gritty like I want to. But we'll see. Anyways, back to the story. Now, when the mobs made it to Rosewood, led by the pack of dogs, they discovered a community of Negroes living better than them, and this infuriated them even more, increasing their rage, more like gasoline on a fire. Now, when the angry white mob came across Mr. Sam Carter, they accused him of taking the suspect away to safety a few miles away to Gulf Hammock. So Sam was tortured, shot, and lynched by the mob. The mob took pieces of Sam that they cut away from him, his ears and his fingers as souvenirs. And when the white mob's dogs led them to the home of Aaron Carrier, who was the nephew of Sarah Carrier, who did laundry for Fanny. And remember, she was the white woman who made the claims. The white men dragged Aaron out of his home. They tied him to a car. And they dragged him to Sumner. Now, once they got Aaron to Sumner, he was cut loose and beaten. And while Aaron was hanging on for dear life, he was taken away from the mob by Sheriff Bob Walker. And Aaron was taken to the jail in Bronson as a favor or a solid to a lawman. Now, when that angry white mob came across a black man named James Carrier, he was told to dig his own grave. And James, he couldn't really do this because he had had two strokes in the past and he was paralyzed in one arm. James was shot by the mob and his body was left lying over the fresh graves of his mother and brother. Now, when the white mob came across the home of Sarah Carrier, on January the 4th, 1923, as many as 25 people were hiding within the home. The 25 people consisted mainly of children. And on the night of January the 4th, the armed white mob surrounded the carrier home and claimed Jesse Hunter was hiding within the home. And although they were outnumbered, the people within the home attempted to fight back. And this caused a gun battle, which turned to a standoff that lasted all night. And unfortunately, things ended when the mob broke down the door of the home. Now, the life of Sarah Carrier was taken by a bullet to the head. Her son Sylvester's life was taken as the result of a gunshot wound. And two members of the white mob lost their lives as well, according to the reports. Now, miraculously, the children were said to have escaped through the back and made it to safety within the woods where they hid. And now, ironically, the standoff that took place at the carrier house is what the newspaper decided to run with. And, of course, they lied and twisted the story. Now, the newspapers, they lied about the number of deaths and they lied about the mob of black citizens going on a rampage. So they pretty much completely twist the story around and the cover up began. Now, more and more white men began flooding into Rosewood under the belief of, a, you know, that a race war had broken out. 
And as more and more men came, the mob's violence escalated more and more. And the angry white mob eventually escalated to destroying the town altogether. Now, the mob, they decided to burn the town down. And their first targets were said to be the churches of Rosewood. And once the churches were burned down, the mobs began to burn down homes. And the black citizens, they were gunned down by the white mobs as they escaped the burning homes. Now, Lexi Gordon, she lost her life as the result of a gunshot wound to the face in which she received when she was discovered hiding under her burning home. And Lexi, she had to send her, her children away to safety, but she stayed behind because she was suffering from typhoid fever. Now, many citizens of Rosewood, they fled to nearby swamps where they hid for several, you know, days or and everything. And some of them, they made it out of the swamps to safety. But others, they weren't so lucky. They were turned back by the sheriff's men. And James Carrier, who was the other son of Sarah Carrier, he successfully made it out of the swamps. And he found refuge with the help of a local turpentine factory manager for a little while. But he was eventually captured by the white mob as well. And the white mob, they forced James to dig his own grave before they ended his life. Now, it's so horrendous and inhumane what happened to these people. And miraculously, some of them made it out safely. Thankfully, two wealthy brothers who owned a train named John and William Bryce helped several black women and children escape to safety. Now, the Bryce brothers, they were familiar with the population of Rosewood and they were aware of the violent massacre taking place. And the Bryce brothers, they drove their train to the area and they rescued the black women and children who had managed to flee. However... They refused to help black men. Now, it's said that they refused to help the black men because they feared being attacked by the white mob. And many of the black people that were rescued by the Bryce brothers, they had been hiding in the home of the white general store owner, Mr. John Wright. Now, Sheriff Walker, he's the one who helped the black people get to Mr. Wright's home. Mr. Wright's home. And from there, they helped them escape on the Bryce Brothers train. Now, Sheriff Walker, he may seem like a pretty good guy, but before we just jump on his bandwagon, I want you all to know that it is said that the Florida governor, Kerry Hardy, offered to send the National Guardian to help. However, Sheriff Walker declined the assistance. Walker claimed they had the situation under control. Under control, Walker. Really? What the F is your definition of under control, dude? Like, seriously? See, I told y'all not to jump on his bandwagon too soon. It seems to me like he helped out of guilt. But that's just my opinion. Let's keep on moving. Now, the mobs, they continued their rampage throughout Rosewood for several days before they began breaking down and leaving. However... On January the 7th, 1923, many of the white mob members returned to Rosewood to finish burning down what was left of the town. All of Rosewood was burned to the ground except the home of John Wright, the white general store owner. I blame the deputy, stated Robbie Martin, a Rosewood survivor to the Seminole Tribune in 1999. Martin stated, and I quote, I blame the deputy sheriff because that lady never dropped a name as to who did what to her. Just said a Negro, black man. But when the sheriff came along with his posses and everything, he put a name to the person, Jesse Hunter. Martin passed away in 2010 at the age of 94. 
She was said to be the last survivor of the New Year's riots of 1923. Yes, you heard me correctly. They tried to play what happened in Rosewood off as a race riot. But it was not a race riot at all. It was, in fact, a massacre that occurred in Rosewood and a prospering black town was destroyed forever. Now, some reports estimate that only six black people and two white people lost their lives during the Rosewood massacre. And I'm inclined to believe that those reports are telling a damn lie. Now, other reports estimate 27 to 150 people, nearly all African-American, lost their lives during the massacre, if not more. Now, this sounds about right to me and a little bit more believable. Now, the governor, he appointed a special prosecutor and special grand jury to investigate what happened in Rosewood. Now, over several days, the jury, they heard the testimonies of nearly 30 witnesses. Witnesses who were predominantly white. And after hearing all the testimonies, the special grand jury concluded they did not find enough evidence for prosecution. So, of course, we know, as with all the other massacres, nothing was done about all the lives lost and no justice was served. I mean, it's unbelievable and heartbreaking to know that they got away with this and what they did to these people. But we also know that that's the sad world we live in. Now, before we close, I must ruffle a few feathers. You know, I got to state the obvious, you know, call a spade a spade. Now, I'm not coming for anyone, so don't come for me. But I'm beginning to see a pattern when it comes to massacres that destroy wealthy and thriving black towns. I mean, think about it. In my video about Lake Lanier, which is shown here in the picture. In my video about Black Wall Street, shown here in the picture. And in this video, wealthy black towns were destroyed over allegations of a black man assaulting a white woman. I mean, this doesn't make anyone else tin hat tingle like mine. I mean, just saying, you know, but tell me what you all think in the comments below. I mean, remember, we can agree to disagree over this way, but respectfully, of course. Yeah, well, that brings us to the end of today's chat. So please like the video. Please subscribe to the video. I'm sorry, please share the video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. If you would like to support the channel in a monetary way, the information to support will be in the description of the video. And until next time, peace, love, and blessings.